Hi everybody, we made it the fourth and final remote lab. Let me know if you like these lectures. I'll polish them up someday. But this is for lab number 17, Simple Harmonic Motion. It's gonna be our final lab that you have to turn in this semester. Uh, make sure you read the instructions on the document provided and in your lab book. I hope to provide some context and go over the equations with you and the derivation today of simple harmonic motion. So, we've looked at this system before. I've got a little demo here of masses on a spring. And we described this system sum by looking at energy conservation. We saw that energy is conserved throughout this bounce. But today we want to describe the actual motion. Can we actually tell at what position would the mass be at any point in time? So that's our goal. Let's stop that. And this is going to be called simple harmonic motion. It's a super important concept. We've taken you through all these different labs, taken you through projectile motion, 2D systems into 1D problems, uh, changing your coordinate system, finding conservative quantities. These last couple labs are about torque and rotational motion. This is one final concept that pops up again and again in physics and describes a lot of things that happen in the real world. And it's called simple harmonic motion. Anytime you have something oscillating with a linear restoring force. In physics, we see these all the time with a, heli a hydrogen atom, any diatomic atom will vibrate with simple harmonic motion. Uh, you can see earthquakes on the earth, shake the earth with simple harmonic motion, pulsating stars pulsate with simple harmonic motion. We can even model many things in real life with simple harmonic oscillations, uh, stock markets, things like that we can model with this. At its basis is you have an energy well, you have an energy minimum, and you have a item in the you have a ball at the bottom of the energy well. And if you move this ball, it's gonna oscillate back and forth about the bottom of the well. That's the basic picture, and it describes all these different systems. It even describes this one we're going to be working with today. And the key to it, again, is this linear restoring force. And that's why springs are important. Springs, we know the force of a spring ooh, equals negative kx. How strong that spring is and how far you pull it. So it's this linear restoring force, that's what we mean by that. And this gives rise to a very important kind of motion. To do so, we've got to look at the differential equation. We see that force is mass times acceleration equals negative kx. And we know that acceleration is the second derivative of the position d squared x dt squared. Now in intro physics 180, simple harmonic motion is going to feel like just kind of an equation you use and you plug and chug. And this is the reason why. It's because to derive it, it takes a differential equation, which we don't require you knowing the math of. But I'm going to sum up all of differential equations for you in one line. Differential equations is just a big toolbox in order to stare at this equation for long enough to find a function of time where the second derivative of that function 
is equal to the function. All right, mine's blown, Larry. You've lost, I've lost you already. But differential equations, if we stare at this equation, we can divide this mass over, Let's divide that over. We need the second derivative of some function to equal the function. If you stare at it for long enough and you rack your brain of all these different functions you might know the derivative of, there's a special set of functions that flip back and forth. And that would be the trigonomic functions. Specifically here, what if we use a cosine? We know the second derivative of a cosine. The first derivative is sine, negative sine. And the second derivative will be negative cosine. So we see on this side we've got cosine, and on this side we've got negative cosine. And now if we slap this constant inside, we do a square root of km, k divided by m, so that when we take the second derivative, that km will pop out twice, get rid of the square root, and be equal to negative km times the time. And because it's differential, we can add a constant in here. So just some constant. Actually, let's call it c. So we've figured out from this equation that we can describe the motion with this equation. All right, let's back, back up a little bit. This, this is just why simple harmonic motion feels like a bunch of equations you just have to use. It's because it's the next level of math. But it's super important. Tons of systems follow this kind of motion. Let's dive into this specific system of masses on a spring. We can also not worry about the differential, just think about the mass on the spring. Could we graph its position versus time? So we start it, or we can start it at positive. We start it at positive one, and we drop it, and it goes to negative one, and up to one, and back and forth. And if we graph that with time, we get this function, where it decreases to negative, then back to one, and sure enough, that's that cosine function we saw. So we can describe simple harmonic motion with this equation. I used y this time because we're using a vertical mass. So it's a y position times the, and anytime you have a cosine, there's only two things that describe a sine or a cosine. There's the amplitude and the period. As long as you have the amplitude and the period, it describes a unique sine or cosine. So here we've got the amplitude, which is A, the angular frequency, which is omega. We'll see in a second how that is equal, Oop, amplitude how that is equal to the period. And we have this phase. For the most part, you're gonna ignore the phase. That's just if we wanted to start this in the middle of a bounce, we could offset this cosine from side to side. But we're gonna ignore the phase for the most part. And from that previous, from the differential equation, we know for a spring, the omega is equal to the square root of k over the mass, the mass attached to the spring. Angular frequency is related to regular frequency by omega equals 2 pi f, the regular frequency. And we know regular frequency 
is equal or the period is equal to 1 over the frequency which is equal to 2 pi square root of m over k plugging those two equations together so here's the period of a spring You notice this equation is some variable we're going to be changing this mass today some variable bubble mouse don't fail me now and some constant what it does it depend on is the amplitude you notice there's no amplitude in this whole equation you can show that with our little demo, and you're going to be seeing that with your calculations today. If we take two of the same masses, and we stop it, if I pull this one just a tiny bit, and let go, and I pull this a lot, I let go when that one's at the bottom, they both reach the bottom at the same time. So even though they have different amplitudes, they have the same period, as long as their spring constant's the same and the mass is the same. You can think about this intuitively too. We don't just have to go through all these math equations. That the further you pull it, the faster the spring goes. But the further you pull it, the further the mass has to go. So here, the mass doesn't have to go very far, but it's also going slow. While here, it has to go a far way, but it's moving fast. And those things cancel each other out in simple harmonic motion. However, if we change the mass, and we try and pull them the same amount, pull this one this far, let me pull this one about that far. There's not really a ruler on here. Uh, I let go when this one's at the bottom. We see the smaller mass moves much faster. Or the bigger mass has a much longer period. Right? It takes more time, a longer period, than the small mass. And we can see that with our equation. Quit out that the mass increases, our period increases. We're going to do that through the calculations today. The last thing we're going to do in the lab today is we're going to treat it as a real spring. Instead of this ideal world where the spring is massless, what if the spring actually had mass? And we can do this. People have empirically calculated there's a whole paper on it, looked it up once, is that the period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the mass hanging plus some fraction of the spring mass over k. Where c times m sub s is a fraction times the spring mass. We're going to try and determine this constant today, how much of the spring mass matters, by linearizing this equation. One last linear regression to finish the semester. If we move this stuff around a ton, we can get t squared. is equal to 4 pi squared over k times the mass added plus 4 pi squared over k times that fraction of the spring mass. 
So if we use several different masses as our x value, we use and we time it to find the period of each mass, then our slope will be this value. And we can determine what our spring constant is by setting it equal to the slope. You can set m equal to 4 pi squared divided by k. So you're going to get that slope out of your calculator when you do a linear regression. You can plug it into this formula and find k. And you also get an intercept. And you can set that intercept that you get from your calculator equal to 4 pi squared over k, where you can use that k from the first equation, times c times the spring mass, which will be given to you. So we can determine that c also by doing the linear equation. You also graph this equation once you're done calculating it and answer the post lab. Got to end it though with my favorite example of simple harmonic motion. And probably the dumbest example of simple harmonic motion is what happens if you jump through the earth. If you've got the earth and you jump in a hole dug all the way through and there's no air inside so you don't reach terminal velocity, what happens to you? And you find out that what you do is you have simple harmonic motion about the center of the earth. This is a great video. I've got it in the document. You should definitely watch it. I'll play a little bit of it now so you can get a taste of it. It might be a little confusing, but it's pretty interesting. As you fall, the mass beneath you decreases, while the average gravitational pull on you from any bit of that mass increases. But the mass decreases more than the average pull of gravity increases. So as you approach the Earth's center, you go faster and faster, but the force pulling you towards the middle gets smaller and smaller. Exactly in the middle, you experience zero net force, because the Earth is pulling you equally in all directions. Though since you're going so fast, you'll continue to speed on towards the other side, gradually slowed by the now increasing force pulling you back towards the middle. The exact same equation, some constant stuff times the distance, also describes a mass on a spring, or a simple pendulum, or a cat in a parabola, and from studying those equations we know that the time taken by the moving object, whatever it is, to go from one side to the other has a simple formula, pi times the square root of the mass divided by the constant stuff. In the case of falling through the earth, your mass cancels out of the equation, so we just need to put in numbers for the density of the earth and the gravitational constant to get the answer. 42 minutes to fall through the earth. This turns out to be exactly the same as the time it takes to fall around the earth to the other side, and it's the number you'll find commonly mentioned on the internet. Pretty crazy. The 42 minutes is definitely funny. This is a minute physics, if you want to check it out. It's just one fun example to end us. I'm sure I'll email with you guys a lot, and we might jump on a Zoom call, but that ends it for Physics 180. Uh, a weird semester. I'm sorry this happened to you guys. I hope you're all safe and sound. Um, and let me know how you, I can help you in any way. Um, but thanks for being great students. And thanks for listening. See ya.